There's a number of properties of expectation that make it very easy to work with. Properties of expectation E. And we're going to look at some of them in this video. So here's a theorem. Suppose x and y are random variables such that the expected value of the absolute value of x is finite and the same thing for y. So I'm dropping the parentheses here. And these conditions just ensure that everything is well defined, but they may be a little bit overkill for some of these. So the first part of the theorem, first property, is that the expected value of a constant a is just equal to that constant for any real value a. And by this I just mean that the expected value of a random variable x equals a if x is identically equal to that constant. That's our first nice little just simple property. Second one, the expected value of a times x equals a times the expected value of x. Again, for any real number a. And closely related to 2, the expected value of a sum x plus y equals the sum of the expected values. And these two together, 2 and 3, are what's called linearity. Very important property of expectation. These make expectation very nice. So now there's more. Here's 4. If x is greater or equal to 0, then its expected value is also greater or equal to 0. So x is a function, so what do I mean by that? I mean, so x is greater or equal to 0 means that it's for every omega, it's greater or equal to 0. So element-wise, it's greater or equal to 0. That's usually what we mean when we write an inequality for a function. And closely related to 4, if x is less or equal to y, then its expected value is less or equal to the expected value of y. And again, similarly here, x less or equal to y means that element-wise, it's less or equal to y for all omega. So these could be called, this could be called an order-preserving property of expectation. Now, there's one more. I'll give you number six. So six says the expected value of the indicator function of the set A evaluated at the random variable x equals the probability that x is in A. And so recall here the indicator function of a set A on some value x equals one. If, x, if the value is in A and 0 otherwise. That's just what, the, what we call the indicator function. And so these, so number 3 here, let me just say, number 3 is going to require using joint distributions of random variables. And we haven't talked about joint distributions yet, so I'm going to hold on. We're going to, so we aren't quite, don't quite have the tools to prove number 3. But the others, two, well, at least two, uh, or rather one, two, four, and five, you could take as exercises. They're pretty, pretty easy exercises in the case of discrete random variables and random variables with densities. Now, this, hold, this theorem holds in general for any random variables. But since we've only defined expectation for discrete random variables and random variables with densities, then you could take it as an exercise to prove it in those cases. One, two, four, and five. Number six is a bit subtle and it requires the following theorem. So here's another theorem. 
if we have a sequence, x1, x2, x3, etc., of random variables, oh, is a sequence of random variables such that xi, each of them, is non-negative, and here I'm using this convention, greater or equal to zero, that means it's element-wise, for all of them, then the expected value of the sum, the infinite sum, of the xi's equals the sum of the expected values. This is a very handy property. This holds, uh, now if this is infinite, then both sides are infinite. If it's finite, then both sides are finite. Now the proof of this involves what's called the monotone convergence theorem of measure theory. And so we're not going to prove this since we haven't talked about Lebesgue integration or monotone convergence or any of those things. But we're going to use it, so I'm just going to state that as a fact, and we will use it to prove number six. Six is a, a bit subtle. So six, so to prove this, let Q of A, the, I'm going to define a measure Q on a set on sets A to be equal to this left hand side of this equality. And I claim that this is a measure. So to prove that it's a measure, first we have to show that Q of A is greater or equal to zero. And this is true because an indicator function is always non-negative, right? Zero or one. And therefore, by property four, since the indicator function is non-negative, then its expected value is also non-negative. So therefore, this expected value is non-negative, and thus Q of A is non-negative. Now the second property of a measure, you will recall, is that it has to be so Q of the empty set has to be equal to zero. And I claim that this is also true because the, so if A was the empty set, then we would have the indicator of the empty set. And the indicator of the empty set, since no element is in the empty set, then that would just be identically zero. So the expected value of zero by property one, expected value of a real number, is just that number. So it's just zero, and that's exactly what we wanted to get. And the last property of a measure is that for a countable union of disjoint sets, so if I have a countable union here of disjoint sets AI, I need this to be equal to the sum of their measures. So what is this? This is the expected value of the indicator of that union evaluated at x, and it's pretty easy to check that the indicator of a disjoint union of sets is equal to the sum of the indicator functions, a i, and this should look a lot like our theorem. Here we have a sum of random variables, remember the function of a function of a random variable, a measurable function, and in this case these are measurable because the AIs are all measurable sets. You can check that makes the indicator a measurable function. A sum of random variables, each of which is non-negative, and these are all non-negative because an indicator is always non-negative. A sum of random variables like that, we can move the expectation through, and What do we get? We get the expected value of each of these indicators. And what's that? Each of these, by definition of Q, is Q of AI. And therefore, we have countable additivity. Now, to finish off the proof, now that we have our nice little measure, Q. 
So we will observe that Q evaluated on this sets of this form for a real number A, any real number A. Well, by definition of Q, this is just the indicator of that set, right? And this for a so for a so I'll prove it in the case of a uh, the proof is, is easy in the case of a discrete random variable. I should have mentioned that at the start. I'm going to prove this in the case of a random variable with a density. So for a random variable with a density, the expected value of a function of x by the expectation rule. All right, we get to use the expectation rule. Remember, expectation rule, where'd it go? Expectation rule. Here we go. Expectation rule says the expected value of a function of x is equal to the integral of that function times the density. So let's make good use of that. So we've got this function, boom, 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 times, let's say the density is f of x. Now this indicator is 0 everywhere except for this interval from minus infinity to a. Right? So we can just 0 out. So we, can only, we only have to integrate from minus infinity up to a. And that takes care of the indicator function. And all we're left with is f of x. And what's this? Well, remember the definition of the CDF. This is pres oh, not x, f of a. This is exactly the definition of the CDF. Well, this is the definition of a of a the CDF for a just uh, random variable with a density. Or rather, I should say, this is the condition for a random variable with a density. It always satisfies this for a CDF. And the definition of the CDF is this is equal to, f of a is equal to the probability that x is less or equal to the number little a. And right, this is just the probability of under the distribution of x, right? Probability under the distribution of x make that clear. Probably that x is in minus infinity a, and that's equal to this distribution. So these are equal on sets of this form, and remember that by the correspondence between, between CDFs and measures on the real line, this condition, the measure on these sets equals the CDF at A, is uniquely characterizes a measure on the line. Right? Because remember from the video on the correspondence between CDFs and Borel probability measures on the line, there was a unique measure satisfying this property. And in this case, since we have two of them, this one is equal to the CDF at A, and this one is also equal to it, that means that Q equals PX. And therefore, Q of A equals, which right by, well, let me say it this way, so the expected value of the indicator of A, which was, by definition, Q of A, that was what we defined Q of A to be. So we have Q of A equals PX of A by this result. And therefore, and this is by definition, the probability that X is in A. And that is exactly what we were trying to prove. The expected value of that indicator equals the probability that X is in A. exactly what we wanted to prove.